So our next speaker is Marc Antoine Miville Deschen, and he will be talking about Planck results on the galactic magnetic field. Thank you. Huh? Yeah, yeah, OK. OK. Uh, first, I would like to, um, to thank, thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a, it's a real honor for me to, uh, to be speaking at this conference. Um, I don't know Carl Eilis personally, but I have the impression that uh, he's been some kind of my thesis advisor. <laughs> I read so many papers of him uh, in my bibliography uh, file. I had uh, files for uh, each letter of the alphabet for, for the first author, and, but I had a file for Hylas, mm -hmm. uh, a single file for that, because it, it had so many papers about, about dust, about H1, about molecular gas, about magnetic fields. I, I, touched, I worked on all those topics, and I think it's pretty much um, because of you, uh, you, you had such a, a huge spectrum, uh, and it's very inspi inspiring for me. So th thank you very much. So I will, I will talk about this uh, Planck result. Uh, you've seen this image a few times. Um, this is based on, a, I'm sorry for the all-sky all, all uh, mapping, but um, I don't know a better way of displaying the full sky on a single screen, on a flat screen. Um, this, is, this is the um, dust uh, radiance map um, we have modeled from the Planck data. So Planck has observed the sky in nine frequency bands. Um, and we were able to model the dust emission. This is the, uh, what we call the dust radiance. It's the integral over frequency of the dust SCD. So it's independent of beta, t, tau. All the modeling information is really just the integral of the modified black body over frequency. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's almost a measure quantity at some, at some point. And it's, it's uh, proportional to a column density times the radiation field. So it's a very uh, useful map that uh, we are using in the dust world. It's been also useful to display um, the properties of the magnetic field and the relationship between dust uh, column density and the magnetic field. So, and the, uh, and the Planck has measured polarization. And so uh, to display polarization angle, we used to use uh, little arrows on a, on a flat map. We, we still do that, but uh, now we mostly use the line, line integral convolution a way of displaying uh, the, uh, the polarization angle. And thanks, this is thanks to Diego Falseta Goncalves. Some of you might uh, know, know him pretty well in this audience. In this audience, he came to, gave, to give a seminar on numerical simulation of MHG turbulence at our institute. And he was showing uh, those crazy things. I was not understanding what it was. But then I realized, well, this, this is probably the best way for us to display polarization angle. It happened to be very, uh, very useful. So what you see here is a map that you don't really see. Uh, and, and it's, uh, we didn't publish this image. I don't think so. It's, it's nowhere on the web or anywhere. So it's really the polarization angle. You see this is the galactic center. This is anti center. And you, you see the, 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 the structure, the regular structure of the magnetic field. But also, it's, it's uh, the fact that it's very tangled. So the map you, you, are, you, you are used to is this one, which is just the combination of the two previous ones. It's a, just a superposition of the two previous. So I'll leave the full sky and concentrate on, on flat maps now. <laughs> just to, um, this, this, this type of combination was, was very, very useful to understand the, the structure of the field. So here you have a portion of the galactic plane where you see that the polarization angle is very per perpendicular to the um, parallel to the galactic plane. Um, uh, the orientation of the field is parallel to the galactic plane. Um, so this is not a surprise. We knew that from, from previous uh, starlight polarization measurements that Carl has contributed to uh, quite a lot. But uh, have, being able to sample that uh, uniformly on the sky is, is very useful. So when you go into high latitude clouds and on the high latitude sky, this is the North Celestial Loop. So we, we saw a picture of that from one of Carl's paper yesterday where there was Zeeman measurements 
in a few places around that, that loop. Now we are able to see what's the orientation of the magnetic field over that full region and try to understand what's the link between the structure and, and, um, and, the, and the field. Um, this is the Polaris flare. I particularly like, like this one. Uh, um, it's, it's not very simple. I mean, we're, we're, we've heard uh, the last two days in the diffuse ISM, matter and the field are parallel. They go together. Filaments are aligned with the, with the, with the magnetic field. When you look at those regions, it's not that obvious. It's not that obvious at all. I mean, there are regions where it's very clear, but even at high galactic latitude, it's, it's not the case everywhere. Here's an example of a region where this alignment is very striking. These are the, this is the LMC, the SMC, and there's this very long filament that was uh, also uh, noticed by De Vaux couleur in 1960. He observed the sky in, in the optical and saw some scattering of dust in this area. There's a very striking picture in one of his papers. So uh, Planck has seen this filament in emission very well, and uh, the, the orientation of the field is, is very, very well correlated with the orientation of matter here. That has inspired us to do some uh, analysis, and I, I will come back to that uh, later. So that's uh, there. the other important piece of information we get from polarization is the polarization fraction. So I was the, the previous images have been showing the polarization angle, but this is this is showing the polarization fraction on most of the sky. Uh, why we don't have information here is at the time of the publication there was a big of ten, big tension between the CMB uh, teams uh, outside Planck that were going for B modes, and they were really interested in, in knowing, especially what's the dust emission in this area. You remember the bicep uh, story, so it was exactly at that time. So we didn't want to reveal exactly what was the polarization fraction in, in, uh, in sensitive areas of the sky. So that's why it's like that. <laughs> so what you notice is that in, in, uh, in the galactic plane, the polarization fraction is low. Um, um, so I, I will come back to that. Uh, but, well, I will, I will describe, well, another way of, of looking at this is, is, is this diagram. This diagram is the polarization fraction. So it's just polarization intensity divided by total intensity as a function of column density or tau or whatever, uh, as a function of column density. Area. I think it's, we use Planck to estimate column density here. What you see is that there's a decrease in polarization fraction when you go into um, uh, uh, greater uh, column density regions, and in some cases in the literature, uh, it has been identified. This type of behavior has, has been related to the fact that in dense regions of, this, of the ISM, uh, grain seems to not be so well aligned, and so that polarization efficiency would go down and the polarization fraction would go down. What Planck is revealing is that this behavior is over the full sky. So even in regions where there's no star forming, uh, no stars uh, forming, we see this decrease with column density. Uh, at the same time, we, this, this S function here measures the, the dispersion of the polarization angle. So in, in a given area, you measure how the polarization angle fluctuates. What we see is that when the polarization fraction is, is low, the polarization angle dispersion is high. So um, the interpretation of that is uh, was we relied on, on numerical simulations to understand this process. And so this, this is result of another paper in the Planck collaboration on using numerical simulation that really measured the same parameter space. And uh, in this simulation, grains are perfectly aligned. So it's, it's not a matter of dust property variations or alignment efficiency. Um, the, only, the only effect that is in this simulation that concerns uh, dust polarization is the variation of the angle of the magnetic field along the line of sight. So what we see here is that for lines of sight where there's a lot of matter and where the, the field fluctuates a lot, well, when you integrate over that long line of sight, you get a long, a long column density, but you go across several uh, cells of, of magnetic fields with different orientation, and that creates depolarization, and it lowers the polarization fraction. So that envelope, that envelope here, that decrease that we see very well over the full sky is a geometrical effect. Most of the effect we see in the polarization fraction map, this map here, most of the effect we see in this map is related to the tangling of the, of the magnetic field along the line of sight and not on dust properties. 
Uh, we also measured that the maximum polarization fraction is almost 20%, which was uh, a big surprise. We were expecting something closer to 10. Um, so I come back to this orientation, the fact that matters and, and field are related. So this is, uh, you, you saw that. And so there was this paper by, uh, led by Andrea Bracco, who uh, measured, uh, the, uh, it, he identified several f uh, filamentary structure uh, at high galactic latitude and measured the, the relative orientation between the filament direction and the, and the field direction, and found that uh, the, sa the same thing, that uh, the, when, when you, you have, you have a, this, this map here is showing the degree of alignment between the field and the matter, and it's, uh, it's stronger in regions where you have low column density and where you have high polarization fraction. So that means that in regions of the sky where you cross only one or two features along the line of sight, uh, you get maximum um, you get maximum alignment. And so again, this is this is mostly due to when you you have non-alignment. Most of the time, it's, it's just a geometrical effect because you're scanning a lot of structures along the line of sight. Uh, we looked into uh, denser regions, so the Taurus molecular cloud. Dick, Dick showed this this um, this image earlier. Um, that's a paper that was led by Juan Soler, who's uh, also in the audience. Um, the, the idea here was to uh, look if um, this, the fact that matter and field are uh, parallel, what we see in the diffuse ISM, is it still true uh, in molecular clouds? When you look at Taurus, it's very interesting. The field is mostly uh, oriented the, the, that way here. You have filament, diffuse filamentary structure that seems to be aligned with matter, but when you go into the main filaments, of the of Taurus here, you get a perpendicular orientation. The field is, and that's also with, with starlight polarization, you see that very well as well. So there seems to be uh, a, a change of, of orientation between the diffuse medium to the denser field. And this, is, uh, this was shown by looking at 10 nearby molecular clouds with this uh, uh, HRO method that is estimating the, 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 the angle between uh, structure in column density and, and polarization angle. Um, so that, that, that kind of um, result was, was looked for, well, we previously we worked on a, with Juan Soler again, we worked on a, on a numerical simulation paper. These, these are numerical simulations. We used, uh, we produced artificial um, dust polarization observations from the numerical simulations. So just to be, to be able to do the same kind of analysis that we do on observations. So these are two, uh, um, two simulations with a weak field and a strong field. Uh, so the bottom, the, the main result is that on low magnetization when the field is, is weak, we find that density and B are always parallel. Um, when we go to stronger magnetization, uh, like in the observations, we see a change of paradigm where we, we see more, uh, we see filaments that are perpendicular to the magnetic field. And that, so uh, qualitatively and even quantitatively, we see the same kind of behavior as in the observations. Uh, but it's just that simple. It's just, yeah, diffuse ICM, it's parallel. When you go into molecular cloud, it becomes perpendicular. Is it that simple? I don't think so. This is an H1 observation at, obtained with the RAO with arc, one arc minute resolution. So um, uh, three, the three colors represent three velocity channels. And um, what we see here is that there's, this is a high, high latitude uh, field with filamentary structure in, in very different direction, that way, that way. And, and the polarization angle seems to be quite happy to, uh, to indicate a, a global field direction. So even in this, in this high latitude field where the column density is about 10 to the 21, you, you have a uh, parallel and per perpendicular. So I don't think it's, it's that simple. So um, uh, um, I, I, will, I will skip that. This, well, this is, this is a, a work I've, we've been doing uh, with Jay Lockman for, uh, in particular on, on the, on the high, high, high intermediate velocity clouds. I, was, I wanted to talk about the fact that we are really trying to understand image D turbulence and the formation of structures in the ISM. That's really what we are trying to do here. Planck is helping us to do one part of that, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very complex uh, uh, thing we want to do. And, um, but my, my gut feeling from the discussions we had uh, yesterday is that uh, there are many observations and, and, and analysis technique that we can combine to, uh, to really uh, um, 
understand and answer some of the question of the complexity we are observing and try to, to really tackle what's the relative role of gravity image turbulence and thermal instability in those systems. So um, just one result, this, 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 um, we're looking at a cloud that is falling on the Milky Way. This, it's a combination of Herschel and Wise data. Um, this, this arch structure at the front of this cloud is uh, reminiscent of a, of a dynamical instability. And so uh, you can relate that to some kind of viscosity. Uh, uh, so, and, and if we estimated what is the, the viscosity uh, of that gas, uh, estimating the size, the typical size of those arches, and uh, if you know that the gas viscosity, you can estimate what is the dissipation, dissipation scale of the medium. And we found 0.1 parsec for that, which is compatible with the ampullary diffusion scale of the WNM for this kind of medium. This is just to tell you that there's, there's other ways to get at, at the uh, at information about the, the MHG turbulence, not only polarization. Even with column density, you can get some information. Um, and just, I, will, I will just conclude on this. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is not, this is a work by Eva, who showed a numerical simulation to try to understand what is the role of the impact of uh, ambipolar diffusion on the power spectrum of column density. So uh, this is, uh, it's compensated the uh, uh, power spectrum of, of density, but you would get the same thing in column density, and they compare two types of simulations with or without uh, ambipolar diffusion. And, and the important thing is that you have a, a turnover here when you include ambipolar diffusion, so you see the dissipation scale of, of uh, turbulence if, uh, in, in the column density uh, gas. So you don't, you don't even have to have velocity or, or magnetic field information to get to that information just with column density. So we've been trying to find that uh, dissipation scale using uh, other type of observation. And this is, this is a paper. Just, yeah, I'm just, no, OK. Uh, yeah, very quickly. Uh, you had a question over there. Uh, one of uh, one of your three questions was how is uh, how is energy dissipated? Yeah, that's and, what uh, I was trying to get to. That. Right. <laughs> and uh, but I, I would like to comment, and this is a comment I was going to make to Blakesley as well, um, that in the scenario that clouds are gra contracting gravitationally, you don't need to worry about that, because uh, the non-thermal motions that we're seeing are actually the result of the gravitational contraction. So the, you don't, I mean, there's nothing, you don't need to dissipate the turbulence to terminate the support to initiate collapse. They're already there. So in that case, I would say uh, that perhaps we don't need to worry so much about it. Well, I, I'm not sure I fully agree with this, but when, when you look at, at, at regions of the sky that look like that, what you see is that you have very clumpy structure, very small scale clumpy structures, and it's not gravity that is doing this. It's, it's, it's not gravity at all. Those, those things are not gravitationally uh, bound, uh, and uh, they're quite dense. So uh, here, uh, there has to be some dissipation and, and processes that are fa favoring the condensation and the increase of density. So um, I'm not sure. If you, if you believe that the, most of the gas in the ISM is, is uh, eight CNM and WNM, and, and that most of the structure we see in molecular clouds are inherited by the CNM structure, then you have to understand how CNM structure forms. And gravity there is not, is not a major role. It's not playing a major role in the formation of structure in the CNM. So that's why I think we need to understand MHD turbulence very well and the energy dissipation processes.